All right, let's talk about something new now. We're still talking about categorical data, but now this is taking a turn. We're going to take a bit of a left turn into a different kind of categorical data and a different way of looking at things. So far we've been looking at binary data, dichotomous data, and now we're going to look at uh, non-binary data, like categories, like categorical data that can have more than two categories. So it's like an analysis of variance, but it's for count data. That's one way to think of it. An analysis of variance, but you just have three, like three or more categories, and you're just counting the number of things in them. Now, if you have two categories and you're counting the number of things in them, you should be using a proportion test. It's actually more accurate. Um, strangely, there are such considerations. But if you have three or more categories, you need to use what we call a chi-square test. Now, some people say chi-squared. It's actually slightly more common to say chi-square. I don't know why. It just feels weird to say chi-squared now. Either way is accurate, though. So when you have more than two categories, then you have a situation that is kind of like this little machine that has marbles dropping into it, etc. We, we talk about the data as being binned or count data in different categories. So we're just going to end up counting the number of observations that end up in each category. So if you have a variable that has three or four different categories, then you just count the number of people who, people or individuals of other kinds, who fall in each of those categories. That's all you really do. You just count the number of observations fitting in each category. Now we looked at some examples like this in class when we talked about um, trying to use the correct uh, test trying to guess, <laughs> hopefully not guess, trying to reason through which which test is going to be the more accurate or the more appropriate test for particular situations. But uh, let's look at this in a lot more detail now. One really important consideration here is that the chi-square test only works when each observation can be only be in one category. So the categories are mutually exclusive. There are plenty of situations where a person could be in multiple categories. Imagine you're doing a survey online and you and you put one of those multiple check boxes where you say check all that apply, which of the following is your ethnicity, check all of the all, all that apply, and have people checking the various things that contributed to their um, ethnic heritage. You can't analyze that data with a chi-square as it stands because a person could have put um, Hispanic and African American. You a person or a, an observation, a sorry, a case, could fall into more than one category validly. If that's the case, you have a different kind of data. It's non-mutually exclusive data. <laughs> it's not okay for a chi-square to do that. You can't do a chi-square. So you have to make sure that that's the case before you can do this. So to walk through how we do a chi-square goodness of fit test, now there's two different kinds of chi-squares, and we're going to do the slightly simpler one now, the goodness of fit test. To walk through how we do it and what kind of situations we would bother to do this for. Let's consider this research question. The research question that we always have is whether the pattern of binning, so the pattern of frequencies, the pattern of the number of cases in this category, in this category, in this category, whether that fits some pre-specified pattern or not. And that forms our null hypothesis, that forms everything that we do. So for instance, if these were our numbers, we could do a, a chi-square on this. We could do a chi-square on the number of marbles that fell into each bin. That would actually be kind of interesting. Because the way this machine is set up, it's set up to produce something that looks like a normal distribution. So we could say, did it? Did it produce the normal distribution? Well, then we might be interested to see whether that actually happened. So you could, I, I used a little formula to come up with what the normal distribution says these frequencies should be if you have this number of categories. And it should be 1 marble, 6 marbles, 10 marbles, 15... Oh no, those are the actual numbers. 1, 6, 10, 15, 13, 4, and 1. That's the actual numbers. And then I used a formula to figure out what those numbers should be. And I just overlaid the curve here. And there's some deviation. There's There are too many uh, marbles over in that second to the left category that says 6, for instance. Um, that's a little bit of a problem. There are a few too many in the one that says 13. So you're getting some deviation from the normal distribution implied number of marbles there. Or you could ask whether people in a particular city are equally likely to prefer a certain store for their home improvement needs. Now let's say you have a sample size of 24. Now you don't have to worry about that 30 business anymore. There are some conditions to the goodness of fit test. Generally the conditions are that you shouldn't have too few observations in just in a, a single cell, in a single bin. 
But other than that, there are very few conditions, very few uh, things you have to be concerned about with a chi-square. So this is one of those SUVs of the statistical world that goes anywhere and does anything. Not anywhere, but it's not quite as temperamental as a, as a means test or something like that. So let's say this is your data. You survey 24 people randomly selected from this small town, like say, you know, a small town like us, except we don't have a Lowe's. And you find that six people say they prefer Lowe's, eight people prefer Home Depot, eight, three prefer Ace Hardware, and seven prefer something else. Now look at that research question. It says, are they equally likely? So you're interested in whether people are equally likely or not equally likely to prefer particular stores. Now it says likely because each one of these could be considered a binary decision. Did you fall in this category, yes or no? Did you fall in this category, yes or no? Did you fall in this category, yes or no, and this one? So this can be considered four different binary variables, but since they're mutually exclusive, it makes more sense to analyze them together as one categorical variable that, with four possible answers. So we can consider this to be sort of a binning situation. Six people fell into the Lowe's bin. Eight people put themselves in the Home Depot bin. Only three people put themselves in the Ace Hardware bin, and seven people said some other store. Now, we were asking whether people were equally likely, so we can draw a line where equally likely should be. And that would be a uniform distribution. A uniform distribution across those categories would just be taking the number of observations. So you happen to survey 24 people, well, if they had been equally distributed, you would have had six people in each category. So those two people are out of place there. Those two observations are making the, the Home Depot category not fit the uniform distribution. And the Ace Hardware category is three observations short of fitting a uniform distribution. And then the other category is one observation too many to fit a uniform distribution. So. I was just coloring things that don't fit the uniform distribution pattern here, so you can see the lack of fit. And that's what the goodness of fit test is. It's a test to see whether your distribution of observations across some bins, across some categories, uh, deviates sufficiently or statistically significantly from some um, pre-specified pattern. And the pre-specified pattern can come from an external theory, it can come from uh, the top of your head, it can come from anything that you can justify to somebody else. So this is one example of that that I did in my research a few years ago. I had my students going out and doing interviews in the community. They were under strict instructions that they were supposed to interview X number of people in this age range and in this age range, but they didn't. You can see those huge bars there in the 18 to 21 and 22 to 25 range. Most of the students interviewed people who were their age. And so I thought, how bad is this? I mean, how, how terrible is it, right? So then I looked up in the census and found out in those, age, in those age ranges what should have happened if the students had actually interviewed a representative sample of the, popul of the population in, in where I was living at the time. And this green jagged bar shows where the, t the heights of these bars should have been if the students had done this. And they didn't. So we can see that they oversampled the 18 to 21 age range by a lot, and that little orange arrow shows it's big, so it's a big deviation. They oversampled the 22 to 25 age range. 26 to 29, they did great, but then once you get into the 30s, they're undersampling anybody older. It's as if college students just hang out with college students. I don't understand this, this phenomenon. Anyway, this is a great example of where we had some hypothesized frequencies. I just looked at the percentages from um, from the, the census for that region, and then I applied those to the N from my, from my study. I said, you know, per, this percentage of my study would give me this frequency if they had done it right. And then I can do a chi-square, a chi-square goodness of fit to see if that's a significant deviation. Hint, it's a horribly significant deviation, yeah. They, 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 uh, they deviated quite heavily. And that was a problem when I was trying to publish that, which still isn't published yet. So the chi-square test that we're dealing with is called the chi-square goodness of fit test. Now, one hint about tests, a hypothesis tests, usually, actually I'm having a hard time thinking of any, any uh, counterexamples, usually the name of the test tells you what the null hypothesis is. So the chi-square goodness of fit test is a test to see whether your data fit whether your frequencies fit 
good, <laughs> whether they goodly fit uh, some pattern of frequencies that you've come up with for some reason, like the, my census pattern, or whether they don't. So the null hypothesis is a good fit. The alternative hypothesis is deviation from a good fit, so a bad fit. So you could call it a badness of fit test, because that's the alternative hypothesis, but these things are named after the null hypothesis, not the alternative hypothesis. So sometimes the null hypothesis is just equal frequencies, like with that Lowe's example, but not always. So like my census example, it wouldn't have made sense to say, to test whether my students had interviewed people equally in different, across the different age ranges, whether they were equally represented, because you, you what you really wanted is representativeness in that case, so I had to go find the frequencies that would have been representative. The null hypothesis implied distribution comes from outside of your analysis. You can't look in this analysis and figure out what the null hypothesis should be. You have to get outside your analysis and figure that out. It's just like mu zero for a one sample t-test. You have to come up with a theory or a hypothesis and a reason for doing this test and then that theory or hypothesis tells you uh, what the expected value is, right? So in this case the expected value is a distribution of values, not an individual value, but it's the same thing. It needs to come from somewhere else. So we set up the data as a frequency table to do this analysis and to think about this stuff. Each cell is going to contain a frequency of responses, so just the number of responses. It's just counting. Each cell is a bin. And in each cell we're going to be concerned with two things. The observed frequency, which is just the number, the number that's in the sample that came out of our data, and the expected frequency. The expected frequency is the frequency that should have been in that in that, in that that bin if the null hypothesis was true. If the null hypothesis was calling the shots and deciding uh, what should be falling into that bin, how many observations should be in that bin, then, then that's the expected value for each of those bins. So you have to go through all the cells in your table one at a time and figure out what the expected value should have been. Often the null hypothesis is that there are equal frequencies, but that's not always the case. And then we add up all the differences between the observed and the expected values. So it's a deviation situation. It's like x minus x bar, but it's observed minus expected in a slightly different pattern, but it's the same It's the same idea, observed minus expected. Difference between what we found in our data and what the null hypothesis says we should have found in our data. This is the same pattern we've seen before. So the null hypothesis is that the pattern of frequencies in the population is the null hypothesis implied pattern. The alternative hypothesis is that the pattern of frequencies in the population is something else. It's a deviation from that pattern. So the statistic that we're going to calculate is this. It's called the chi-square statistic. That's a Greek letter chi, which I sometimes write just as an x. Because I don't think there's any actual difference between a chi and an x. So for each cell, you find the observed frequency, which just comes from your data collection. You subtract from that the expected frequency. You square the difference, and then you divide it by the expected frequency. So it's sort of like a an average squared expected thing. It's or an average squared deviation. It's very similar to the uh, variance formula where you have x minus x bar squared over n. This is O minus E squared over E. And you, then you add, you do that once for every cell, and those are the chi-square components, and then you add up all those components with the big summation sign there, and that, that's your chi-square. And then you look it up in a table, and you have a critical value. It's like it's like the F distribution in that it's positively skewed and it's always going to the right. There's no concerns about one or two tail, etc. You uh, look it up using degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom is the number of categories uh, minus one. The number of categories are bins, the categories in your variable minus one. So you use that to look up the right uh, um, sorry, the right distribution and the right the right critical value in the chi squared table, which is in the back of your textbook, I think it's page 412. And then you compare your observed chi-square to the critical chi-square. If your observed is bigger, you reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis was that everything fit nicely. So then you say, I reject that. It did not fit nicely. In the population, we don't think that the fit is very good, that it fits this uh, pattern that I've specified here. This is what the chi-square distributions look like. It's a f whole family of different distributions. And they're crazy. They're all positively skewed. It only goes up to 8, but you can have chi-squares, like critical chi-squares that are 16 and 18 and 20 and things like this. So this is uh, a few of them. 
they're kind of crazy looking, but they're all right skewed. And I'll have some diagrams as we do some examples later, and so you'll be able to get some familiarity with these distributions. Let's run through this example of whether people prefer their home improvement stores equally or not. There's the data. Let's put our little graph back up here, and we I, I put those dots to remind you that these are not means, these are just observations in a bin. Each observation it's just choose a bin. Which one did it go into? That's all it is. So it's kind of like marbles in a stack in a bin. So the, the research hypothesis we had implied that we should compare a uniform distribution for those four stores versus something that's not uniform. So of course it's not uniform here, but that's always the case. In the sample, everything will deviate. Nothing looks like, like the population. No, nothing in the sample ever looks exactly like the population. So there is deviation here. The question is, is this enough deviation that we believe that the entire population has deviation? So were people's answers, was there enough of a variation in preference for the stores in the sample that we believe that that reflects a, a differential preference for the stores in the population? So this, this study could very much have been done by the Better Business Bureau or by uh, Home Depot. Maybe they want to show that they're the most popular store in town or something like that. Uh, so you've got a sample value, but that's never what you're really interested in. The sample just tells you about the population, and the thing it is telling you is whether it's believable that there could be a significant deviation from this distribution that you specified. In this case, a uniform distribution of frequencies in these categories in the population. So let's look at our data here. We've got our observed values and our expected values. If the null hypothesis is true, the null hypothesis is that people equally prefer the different stores, then we would have expected in a perfect null hypothesis world to get six people answering for each of the stores that they all preferred the stores and so everything's even Steven and everybody's happy and everything's equal. Now of course we wouldn't expect that uh, through random sampling because what are the odds even if it's a perfectly even distribution in the population what are the odds that your sample would find that and so that's where the chi-square distribution comes in. How much can you deviate before you start to believe that you're seeing a deviation that's in the population, not just in the sample. So the chi-squared distribution here, um, or the chi-squared, yeah, the chi-squared distribution, the chi-squared value that we have to calculate has to be that formula, the sum of the observed minus the expected values for each cell squared divided by the expected value. So we need to get those chi-squared components, then add them all up, and that'll be our chi-squared value. So Let's add everything up. Let's just make some different rows here. Let's have an observed minus expected row and fill that in there. So the observed value for lows was six. Six people said they preferred lows. Well, the, hypo the null hypothesis says if it's all even, Stephen, there should have been six. So that difference is zero. But Home Depot had too many. So their observed was eight, whereas the even, Stephen null hypothesis said they should have only had six. So they, they have a difference of two. Ace Hardware underperformed a bit, and so their difference from expected was negative three, and the other category overperformed slightly. So, so we square those, and then we divide each of them by the expected. So you get 0 0.67, 1.5. And when you add all those together, you have a pretty small number, 2.33. It's hard to know if that's big enough, small enough, unless you've had a lot of chi-squared experience. So we refer to this distribution. So we look up in our table in the back of the book and we find that the p-value is 0.51. Actually you're not going to get that out of the table, you're going to get that out of the computer. But the chi-squared critical I believe for this is something like uh, 5.99, something like this, and this chi-squared was not big enough. So in the chi-squared distribution for three degrees of freedom, well it's not five point something, it's maybe four point something. Anyway, two is not big enough. 2.3 is not big enough. So our p-value is 0.5. It's gigantic. It's certainly not less than 0.05 or anything like that. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis. The evidence does not suggest that the town residents prefer one uh, home improvement store over another. This sample does not give us any indication of that. So let's look and, and see what we can figure out about this survey business and whether my students, um, whether the 
the students had a sampling pattern, had an interviewing pattern that was significantly different from representative. That might be a way to think about it. So we can look at these deviations here. Let's look at this data. We have a lot of categories here. We have, I think, nine categories, so it's going to be a chi-squared distribution with eight degrees of freedom. There's the observed frequencies. Now the expected frequencies I got from looking in the census table and saying there should have been this percentage of people who were 18 to 21. If it was the same as the region, there should have been this percentage of 22 to 25, etc. And that gave me decimal numbers, and that's okay. It doesn't make any sense that there should be a 19.8 observations or a fraction of an observation. But for the math to create the chi-square, that's just fine. We perfectly okay with splitting discrete values up like that if it's the machinery in the middle of something like this. So I calculated the expected values by looking in a census table and applying that to the N of my study and figuring out what that should have been. Um, and so let's get our, our components here. The observed minus the expected. Just looking through here you can see that some of these numbers are bigger than others. So you can see which categories are having the, the problems. Which categories are deviating too much from that expected value or that, that expected pattern. We scare, square those, gives you a bunch of really big numbers, and then we divide, and then we add them up. 257.9, mostly in those first two categories making that happen. That's a really big number. We're gonna reject any and all null hypotheses here. This is gigantic, but let's graph it because it's fun. I had to, to, to include really far right-hand portions of the graph that are so tiny you can't see them. Um, our chi-square observed is 258.4 over here, and the p-value is extremely small. I think I put the right number of zeros. It's 15 or 16 zeros down to a more or less a 1 at the end. Anyway, it's less than everything. It's less than 0.05. It's less than 0.01. So yeah, the students did deviate seriously from the sampling plan here. Stupid students. Anyway, we reject the null hypothesis, and we say the distribution of age categories in the study was statistically significantly different. So the distribution of age categories, now it's not about the study, I worded this badly on the slide here, it's always about population. So the distribution of age categories representing the population we were actually sampling. We were actually sampling only a, only a slice of the true population our population that we are sampling from was not the same population that we wanted to sample from. That's what we're saying here. Our population was more college students than it was actual, um, you know, representative age ranges in, in the valley where we were living there. So we would reject that null hypothesis, which in this case is bad news for me. I didn't want to reject that null hypothesis. So hypothesis testing with chi-squared, same as everything else. You state the Nolan alternative, you choose your alpha, you look up a chi-square chi critical, unless you're using a computer then you don't need the critical values. You state your rejection rule, you calculate chi-square observed, you state your decision, and you state your conclusion. And we'll do some examples of that in the next videos.